Gentlemen, welcome. We are here today to talk about why the fuck aren't Asian men considered sexy? <laughs> There's only four left and that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just setting the tone for this conversation. Thank you. The idea that Asian men in American media mm. are emasculated and seen as somehow less than than other racial counterparts is something that's been historically sort of plaguing a lot of the different projects we've all probably worked on in the past. Why do you think Asian men aren't considered sexy? It's the result of effectively a historical campaign. I mean, you know, Asian immigrants first started coming to this country. Everything from political cartoons, uh, obviously government policy, was all about kind of framing Asians as as almost bestial vermin. And, you know, women were, were kind of pushed in one direction as sort of over-sexualized, exotic. And men, meanwhile, were pushed into this corner of neutered eunuchs, you know, with tiny bodies and... and Barbaric tendencies. <laughs> tiny bodies. <laughs> it's like the opposite of what uh, was purported as like the Western ideal of, of gender norms, right? right? Asian characters, we never think of them as anything but, at best, up until like maybe I think in the last five, 10 years, the friend. I mean, it's interesting though, even like the masculinized roles, like the, you know, say martial artists and so on and so forth, yeah. they're still kind of not getting any. <laughs> you know, it's like. No, Jet Li <laughs> didn't even get to kiss a Lee at the end that of Romeo the Must Die. Yeah. They had a good long handshake. and Because <laughs> like, Asian yeah, men have sex that. by really prolonged handshakes. <laughs> There's a really interesting valley we're discussing where the two peaks for Asian male attractiveness these days is like really strong virile masculinity or really specifically designed femininity. But this valley of what we might call, in a layman's way, the average Asian American male is never really spoken to. And what's interesting is I feel like the average male in other cultures, specifically, let's say, with white American culture, is constantly spoken to. Like the idea of being an average Joe is literally almost a badge of honor. You even see more diversity of size and shape and so forth among African American and Hispanic actors, at least in comedies, right? If you are an Asian lead, you have, almost have to be super hot. Which when that, when that trickles down, what does it say for the young Asian American male who's considered more average looking, it automatically makes you subpar to the national average outside of your race. Like people talk about K-pop as if it's going to save the world, right? Like Asian idols from Asia <laughs> are going to make it all good for the rest of us. And the fact is, as much as I appreciate that it's kind of cool that it's being imported here, it's again, one of those things which doesn't quite solve it for just everyday Asian guys in the middle of America. India doing well and like, all these macho Abhishek Bachchans and John, <laughs> John Abraham, who are like the Tom Cruises yeah. and Brad Pitts of India, it still has nothing to do with my life. Yes, we have unicorns, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, they're genetically gifted people of every ethnicity, sure. there's no question about that. But it doesn't adjust the larger reality that we live in a culture in which the basic standards, you know, not the ones that we can aspire to, not the ones that if we, you know, gym ratted all of our lives and we're born with the right parents and all that stuff, whatever, like the basic standards what an Asian guy looks like, probably falls short in different ways. You never ever get to see these images in media of like an Asian guy you grew up with or your, your brother or your father. With media in this country, because it has been predominantly white and I get like, I, you know, I'm sure like some people are like, stop talking about not being white. But when you're not the majority in it, you have to have that visibility just so you can show people like, it's not the only option. If you like that, great, but like it can't be the only thing you see. If I tell you and I'm at a party, I'm like, oh, I want you, my, my girl to meet my friend. He's a he's a white guy. What does he look like? Oh, he's you know brunette, and he's like a, a little husky, but he's really funny. And they'll be like, Oh yeah, sure, I'll meet him. Whatever. <laughs> and then I'm like, Oh, you want to meet my? Uh, here's my Chinese friend. He's coming. He's you know he's kind of you know he's like black hair and a little husky. They'd be like. I'm gonna go too <laughs> That is so funny. It's, it's so it's true. Very true. Everyone has gotten that. Because people might say, well, here's the old argument of, it's a preference, it's not like racism. Oh, yeah. And the whole thing is it comes down to if you walk into any situation and just because someone's of a certain ethnicity, you have a lower opinion of them, that starts spreading in its own way to things that actually have, like I think, a lot of dire consequences. Every time I hear the term preference brought up in any kind of conversation, it always feels like it's a danger signal that somebody's about to like say stuff that's bullshit. <laughs> and it, that's because the assumption is that there's some sort of level, level playing field, right? right? Mm -hmm. So in say casting movies, it's like, oh, well, you know, we're casting for talent. We're not really looking for people of a certain color or height or shape or whatever. But then why are you always picking the six foot tall white guys, you know? The first like silent films of Hollywood, you have uh, Anime Wong yeah, anime and- Sesu Hayakawa. Sesu yeah. Hayakawa, who was like the first real like Japanese 
Asian male idol was lusted over mm -hmm. by American women. But then there's so much that comes into the propaganda of politics and media that shifted public perception of men. Because at some point, right, he couldn't get work anymore mm -hmm. in Hollywood films and had to go to Europe. There's also pre-World War II, you mm -hmm. know, when then we were worried about everyone was Japanese and mm -hmm. plotting against us. And then the Korean War, yeah. and then the Vietnamese War, well, and know, everything was like this. T it, this is not that long ago, though. That's the thing people forget. This is what our parents went through. The reality is this. We are going to live, hopefully, in a world which is going to continually get closer together and in a country which is going to get more and more diverse. There are enough of us all different that if we just learn from one another, whether online or off, things will get better on their own. And maybe whether or not we as Asian men get dates is not a very big piece of what justice no, looks huge. like. <laughs> well, so huge. But, <laughs> but what it is, is it's part of a much larger set of changes. Right. And for that, I'm proud that we're at least just having this conversation. Yeah. What I really encourage, especially a lot of viewers out there, is to not be as reactive like everyone is, but be more responsive. Yeah. Like if you see something where you want to see more Asian American men in media, sometimes it's not just the actors. You have to find out who the executive producers are on a project. You have to find out who's the writer. Like there's so many different things at play that shape the idea of what's being told to young people in entertainment, in politics, in media, that you can't just center on the image of someone. Yeah, it's not gonna be a whole writer's room of white men working on a BET show. They can obviously lend themselves to the experience, but it can't be everyone, it can't be all. We are given an opportunity now as just as Asian men in Western media to say we can be hot. Any one of us can feel and express ourselves in a sexual way, and it's not weird, and it's not a gimmick, it's just who we are.